I am delighted that we have the opportunity to present the next speaker. He is well known for his writings in the particular field to which we have been devoting our attention today, but he has an even greater reputation, really, as the author of several outstanding books of poetry, which are real poetry and not just modern verse. And uh, I wish there were time for him to give us two talks tonight, one on the topic that we expect, and one a reading from some of these delightful works that he has put out. I understand there's a new one on the way, or is it out already? A new one recently out, and those of you who still enjoy really good poetry should look it up. But Professor Root has really achieved his current reputation in our circles for his study of what has been going on in the schools and colleges in the way of brainwashing, as Mr. Hunter would describe it. And so we are delighted to have him here to give us the result of some of his studies in that field. Professor E. Merrill Root. Colonel Bunker, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, fellow Piketty's. <laughs> there is an old song which bids us lift up our heads and shout, it's a great day. This has been a great day. I don't mean merely the inspiring speeches. I mean your wonderful spirit here today, your joy in patriotism. It has been indeed a great day and we may lift up our heads and shout. Now just for that reason, naturally, I am very proud to be one of your speakers. But just as naturally, I am very humble to be one of your speakers. Every time I am to make a speech, I am reminded of a certain Irishman who in the old days was driving an open wagon loaded with gunpowder. In a moment of abstraction, he lit his pipe and then he tossed the still lighted match over his shoulder. And as he went upward in the resulting chaos, they heard him exclaim, sure, and I always knew I could rise to the occasion. But then he added, what worries me is how I'll feel when I come down. Uh, and it worries me how I'll feel when I sit down. Let me hasten to assure you, however, that I am not really worried about how I'll feel when I sit down. And that is not because of me, it's because of you. Uh, you have been through schools and colleges, and yet somehow you've escaped. Uh, I, I think you might be... <laughs> I think you might very well have the distinguished degree, let's see if I get it right, D-E-F-B-W. That means you are doctors, of escape from brainwashing. <laughs> and that, that is a, a distinction. Now, even in this day of what I would call liberal insanity and collectivist slavery, you dare to believe in sanity and freedom. Even in this day of a Freudian drift, when apparently we're all at the mercies of our libido, you dare to believe that as a man sows, so shall he reap. Uh, in a day when the aestheticians uh, tell us from the beatniks, by the way, a beatnik is a person who is at the bottom of the heap and going down. But uh, <laughs> the, the aestheticians from the beatniks to Pablo Picasso, that genius become clown, uh, all of these tell us that grass is always the rather horrible color of spoiled liver. But you today dare to believe that grass, occasionally at least, is still green. And in a day uh, when economic determinism, that is material circumstance, is supposed to decide everything, you still believe that uh, every outside must have an inside. And then in the beginning there is the word. And in a day when the Keynesians, uh, especially in Washington, uh, tell us that uh, 2 plus 2 equals 0 yesterday and will equal 13 tomorrow, 
you still dare to believe that two plus two are four. And that is a very daring thing. <laughs> Why, you know, in Washington today, they think that the only way to have happy mules is to feed them buttered hay. But uh, you, you don't believe that. And therefore I say to you that you are the only nonconformists in the world today. The conservatives are the only revolutionists in the world today. Revolutionists against the slavery called socialism. And so I salute you and I'm glad to be with you and I'm not too afraid of how I'll feel when I sit down. Now that is a wonderful feeling. You as conservatives know very well that today we conservatives are very lonely people indeed and we have to live adventurous lives while they still let me teach. I used to tell my students, <laughs> I used to tell my students, uh, if you want to uh, realize the great Nietzsche's great precept and live dangerously, just become a conservative. You'll live dangerously if you do. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, I used to uh, think that I wanted to go to Africa and hunt big game. But now that I've become an articulate conservative, I don't have to go hunting big game. Big game comes hunting me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the uh, man-eating lions, the hyenas, the uh, cape buffaloes, the rhinoceroses, they come sniff, sniff, sniffing at my door. Uh, fee, fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of a conservative. <laughs> uh, for the last uh, two decades at least, uh, I felt very much like a lonelier Daniel in a den of fiercer lions. But tonight, uh, after your uh, gracious invitation and your generous presence, I feel like a lion, of course, a very small one, in a den of friendly Daniels. And that is a very pleasant feeling uh, indeed. Now with that introduction, I come to my subject this evening, which is the relation of education, our schools, our colleges, our textbooks, and our teaching, to the debacle of the American mind. The debacle, the intellectual and spiritual debacle uh, of the American mind. One might say that my subject is the danger not of atomic fission, but of academic fission. Uh, ours is the danger indeed, not of nuclear fallout, but of scholastic fall down. And that is the subject uh, that I wish to discuss with you this evening. But before I do that, uh, I have to suggest what is the great danger to America? to our uh, United States of America, to our constitutional republic, and to sanity and freedom in the world. What is our greatest danger today? Now today, under the shadow of the hydrogen bomb, many excellent, honest, well-meaning, but uh, peculiarly naive or ignorant Americans believe that our only danger or our chief danger lies uh, in the gimmicks and the gadgets of material war. They think our great danger is outward military attack. Now, I wouldn't for a moment deny that that is a danger. We face today the dirtiest fighters that the world has ever known. They are the people who say they would liquidate their class enemies. Liquidate. How suave and gracious a word. It sounds liquid. Uh, <laughs> It sounds as if uh, it would flow and glow. It sounds as harmless as pouring honey on the pages of a telephone directory. But what do they mean when they say liquidate? They mean to place the muzzle of a high-power pistol behind the right ear. They never shoot you through the left ear. Uh, behind the, the right ear and squeeze the trigger and blow the gray brain plasm out through the shattered skull. That is, we face the people who say liquidate and who mean murder. I'll think of another illustration of the kind of people the, the communist mentality makes out of our human brothers. The late Dr. Thomas Dooley, in his very fine book, Deliver Us From Evil, tells a tragic little story of how he was traveling in this country, and he came to the airport in St. Louis, and there he saw some oriental young men, and he suddenly noticed 
that they were lacking an ear on one side of their heads. And he thought he recognized or remembered something. So he stepped up to them, and sure enough, they were young men whom he had known as boys in Vietnam. They had grown up in a Christian village, and then the communists came in and took over. And they said that these boys had listened to evil words, and they were going to cure that. What did they do? Did they argue with them? Did they reason with them? Did they even brainwash them? <coughs> no, they took a pair of pliers, they clamped the pliers under one ear, they tore that ear loose from the head so that it hung by a thin ribbon of blood and skin and flesh and had to be cleanly removed by surgery, which Dr. Tom Dooley had done. Now, these boys had listened to evil words. And what were those evil words? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't need to repeat the beautiful words. You know them by heart in spite of the Supreme Court of the United States. You know them. But these... <laughs> these were evil words. And to cure uh, the boys of hearing these evil words, they, the communists tore an ear off. Well, that's the kind of person we face. Not only chicanery, but skullduggery, mayhem, murder, any kind of force is liable to be used. And therefore, we must be on our guard, our defenses must be firm, our retaliatory power must be sure. But having said that, let me hasten to add with all the high seriousness at my command, that that is not our only danger, nor I believe our chief danger. Our chief danger lies not in outward military attack, but in inward cultural subversion. When in Czechoslovakia, Benesh had finally to take that wincing leap from the high window, what was the reason? It wasn't merely because the communists at last had come in with military power, it was because the soul of Czechoslovakia had been betrayed and the mind of Czechoslovakia had been destroyed. Any military man will tell you that while weapons the latest and the best are highly important, the question of morale is much more important still. The will to fight, that is what turns good soldiers into great soldiers. Faith, hope, and love the consecration to a great cause, the motivation of a high morale. These are the things that make really great soldiers. And at what do our enemies aim? They aim at our faith, our hope, and our love. They would destroy our faith in America, our love of America, our hope for America. They would destroy our patriotism. They would destroy our values, our sense of quality, meaning, and value. They would reduce us to passivism and nihilism until, like that uh, unfortunate young G.I. who went on a safari of murder and finally was captured, uh, they found tattooed on his breast, I hate life. Now that's what the communists would do to us. They would make us hate life. They would destroy in us all sense of quality, meaning, and value. And if they do that, they destroy the city of man's soul, and they can easily take the city of man's body. Speaking about practical matters, lately in Cuba, uh, under that uh, human mistake and hairy monstrosity uh, known as Fidel Castro, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, we were in danger, physical danger. We knew that uh, he had, as I think he still has, uh, some... Uh, of missiles that uh, might destroy our eastern cities. And we thought that was dreadful, and we uh, acted to remove them. I hope we removed them. I, I rather doubt it, but at least we tried to, and uh, or thought we did. But what was the real difficulty and the real danger? It wasn't those missiles in Cuba. It was that monster in Cuba. As long as you have a communist in Cuba, as long as you have Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and Raul Castro and beyond, behind them the horrible ideology of communism, you'll have missiles or worse than missiles. And how did that happen? It was because 
We were sold a bill of goods. It is because, it is because our minds were confused, our spirits, our resolute wills were dimmed. It was because a man named Herbert Matthews, writing in the New York Times, which fortunately is speechless uh, at the present time. <laughs> a man named Herbert Matthews, writing in the New York Times, assured us Castro is the Robin Hood of Cuba. Castro is the, uh, I believe he said, the Abraham Lincoln of Cuba or some nonsense like that. And then a good, honest, but exceedingly naive liberal named uh, um, Sullivan on television put his arm around the bearded monstrosity and said, uh, they, they tell us that you're a communist, but your men all wear scapulas, so how can you be? And he called him, uh, I believe, the George Washington of Cuba. I wish at least they'd get the historical figures straight. But uh, the George Washington of Cuba, the Abraham Lincoln of Cuba. And all the while, anybody who knew anything, anybody sophisticated, anybody who knew the documents, anybody who knew the realities, knew that Fidel Castro had grown up as a communist, that he'd been a communist assassin in Latin America, that uh, he was a rascal from the grassroots up. Uh, and uh, they should have known that, but they didn't. And so again, it was because our minds were confused, our spirits were dimmed, our wills were weakened, uh, that uh, we allowed a Castro in Cuba, and everything that has followed since came simply because of that intellectual mistake. Now how does a wasp destroy a much more powerful insect? A wasp will come to a much larger, much more powerful insect, and will sting the central nerve system, thus paralyzing the other creature and uh, putting it into a sort of vital deep freeze. And then at its will, at its leisure, uh, it can destroy and devour the creature. Now that is the way communism plans to destroy us. That is the way it is destroying us. That is the way in which uh, we will be destroyed unless we wake up uh, in, in time to be awake and aware, to realize the danger, to have the clear mind, the fervent spirit, and the resolute will, that is the way to be saved. Now because of that, education is one of our uh, great centers of danger. One brilliant professor, and they are many of them quite brilliant, one brilliant professor infecting his captive audience with his own cynical distaste for free enterprise and his own sentimental affection for collectivism is more danger to us than two hydrogen bombs over a city. <laughs> One dull textbook, and believe me, I've studied them, and they're fearfully dull. One dull textbook, again infecting its captive audience with the idiocy that uh, free enterprise is piracy, that private property is theft, that uh, the state should be the mortal guard of man's idolatry, and our wet nurse and policeman from the cradle to the grave is more danger than the loosing uh, of missiles or the launching uh, of um, uh, bombs. Our real danger lies there in the realm of the mind, that is so true that the army's greatest expert on psychological warfare um, has uh, told us in a famous interview in U.S. News and World Report that our, our real uh, war today is not a war uh, of, uh, of weapons, uh, but rather a war of ideas. And he says, I quote, this uh, renders military weapons, if not obsolete, uh, at least needless, he means for the time being, at least needless because we are fighting a war of ideas. And today, the real hot war is the Cold War. The Cold War is the really hot war. We are fighting today a war not of bullets but of brains, not of missiles but of minds, not of space but of spirit, not of weapons but of wills. And if we win that war, 
I personally don't believe we'll ever have to fight a shooting war, but unless we win it, <laughs> unless we win it, we will lose something more uh, than war. We will lose our souls in slavery. Now let me show some ways in which education is working to uh, pervert our minds, to confuse our minds, to dim our spirits, uh, to hypnotize our wills. Just recently, I think it was about a year ago, in the town of Reading, Connecticut, there was a high school senior, I believe her name was Virginia Olson, and she wrote uh, an essay for the uh, uh, high school paper in which she said this, and I quote exactly, she said, to be a good patriotic American is to be a blindly stupid individual. Let me repeat that. To be a good patriotic American is to be a blindly stupid individual. Now she wrote that in the town of Reading, Connecticut. And near that, uh, in the gallant years of the American Revolution, Connecticut's greatest son, Israel Putnam, kept alive the hopes and fears of Connecticut in the winter camps that we may call the Valley Forge of Connecticut, in the hills of Reading, with his gallant spirit, his noble will, his resolute courage. In the winter and the blizzards, he kept alive not only the hearth fires, but the heart fires of Connecticut. And now in Reading, this little uh, unsophisticated, sophistic, sophisticated, uh, writes that to be uh, a good patriotic American is to be a blindly stupid individual. I wonder what she knows about the heritage of America. Does she not know the greatness of our literary figures? A Herman Melville, a Walt Whitman, a Ralph Waldo Emerson, a Henry David Thoreau. Does she not know all these figures and the great heritage and the great tradition? Is it to be a blindly stupid individual to love a nation that has produced such great things of the spirit and of the soul? That uh, is the question that we would like to uh, ask one like Virginia Olson. But this is not something that is just in Reading, Connecticut. Massachusetts should not be proud. Also about a year ago, I believe in the town of Wellesley, uh, the high school senior class in a high school there refused the DAR reward for good citizenship. Why? Because they said, the DARs are a narrow and reactionary organization. Of course, uh, we conservatives are supposed to be uh, narrow and reactionary. We're supposed to be a throwback to the dinosaur and the pterodactyl. We are supposed to be uh, a sort of moss-covered bucket hanging in a well that has long since gone dry while all the public water supplies are hideously fluoridated. Uh, <laughs> In fact, uh, in our schools today, young people are conditioned or brainwashed, if you will, to believe that anyone uh, like the DAR or like any conservative anywhere uh, might be defined somewhat as an irreverent student defined as chaperone. A chaperone of the student is a person too old to get into the game, but still eager to intercept a few passes. Well, uh, that sort of thing is, of course, false, but that is the sort of thing that results in refusing the uh, award uh, by the DAR. And this isn't something that is just here and there. It's all over the country. For example, in the Menlo Atherton High School in California, a 16-year-old girl named Catherine Larson uh, wrote an essay uh, of which her... Uh, teachers thought so highly that they decorated it with an A, and they sent it over to England where it was published and publicized. And what did this girl say in this uh, wonderful article that uh, rated an A? She said, we must prepare for a Russian occupation of the United States by a major change in the attitude of the American people. Are you ready for that? Do you want a Russian occupation of the United States by a major attitude, a change in the attitude of the American people? And this poor little innocent at home and abroad 
didn't even know that it wouldn't be a Russian occupation of the United States, it would be a communist occupation of the United States. She didn't even know that in Hungary, men, women, and children were crushed under the treads of tanks like Easter eggs under a bulldozer, that uh, uh, in communist China, uh, that great and noble and ancient civilization uh, is uh, at least in attempt eradicated and that great and noble nation uh, turned into a heap of fire ants. She didn't know that. Now, what sort of teaching, what sort of textbooks, what sort of spirit um, is there in our schools today that all over the country, and these are only a few examples uh, out of many, uh, our young people are being infected with that dreadful idea that it is better to be red than dead. What they mean is it's, re it's better to be yellow than dead, but they don't say that. And unfortunately, it is not a decayed philosopher who has lived too long in England uh, who popularizes uh, that slogan. It is something that infects us too. And uh, our young people and our older people, they sometimes say, I'd rather crawl uh, all the way to Moscow on my knees than die under the hydrogen bomb. Well, as for me, and I say it sincerely, uh, I, I, if I have to die, let me die on my feet. Let me die cleanly. Let me be blown to smithereens, but not live as a slave. Don't we remember the great words of Patrick Henry? Had they been lost in the academic and scholastic shuffle? Uh, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? I know not how others may feel, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That is the way America once spoke, and pray God she will so speak again. But that is the sort of thing that happens. Or in our textbooks, in my brainwashing in the high school, uh, I make a thorough study, absolutely documented, of 11 major texts used in high schools all over the United States. And I think as I studied them that I began to realize why these uh, girls said what they did why so many students say what they do. There in not all but too many of these textbooks, patriotism is, in, uh, is equated with something in quotation marks called 100% Americanism. That, of course, is dreadful. Or it is equated with nativism, whatever that means. Or it is equated with the Ku Klux Klan. How can you expect our young people to understand how can you expect them to, uh, to take the guns we give them and go out halfway across the world to fight when they don't understand what uh, they're defending or what patriotism is? And in these textbooks, in almost all of them, not quite all of them fortunately, but in almost all of them, uh, the American Revolution is made a civil war between the haves and the have-nots. The nation indivisible is changed into a class war. Uh, the founders of our republic are uh, rather sneered at. The uh, framers of our constitution uh, are supposed to be those who fashion a rich man's plot against the rest of us. And as the texts go on, without exception, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, the Spanish-American War uh, is called American imperialism. And the expansion uh, of our country, the discovery of oil wells, the expansion of railroads, the, gr uh, the growth of great industries is all supposed to be caused, to have been caused, by what I called Napoleons of finance and robber barons. And on the other hand, anybody who can be called in any sense, even the Henry Wallace sense, a progressive is supposed to be, uh, well, like the... Uh, handsome hero in that ancient melodrama, Murder in the Old Red Barn. Uh, and uh, all of American history is presented to us in this guise, which I personally believe is false. I don't so much say that these texts are subversive. I say, and this is an even more basic criticism, they're just nonsense. They're bad history. They're not the truth. Give us the truth. <laughs> Give us the truth, and the truth will make us free. 
but these are not the truth. And in foreign affairs, these texts, almost without exception, do not give us the truth. Again and again and again, for example, uh, they, they tell us that uh, the Russian people overthrew the Tsar and set up a Soviet regime. That is a lie. The Russian people overthrew the Tsar and set up a constitutional republic, uh, tainted a bit by socialism, but at least it was a, it was a constitutional republic. And then the, the red goons are under Lenin and Trotsky, first by fraud, and they told lies that they would give the land to the peasants, that they would bring freedom, that they would do this, that, and the other, which they never did or intended to do, first by fraud and last by force, first by lies and last by bayonets. They took over the Russian Revolution and perverted it. Now, how do you expect our young people to know the truth when in history after history after history they are not told the truth? Or in the relation of the Nazis and the Communists, the dice are loaded. There is a double standard. Now, uh, I called uh, uh, Mussolini a good gorilla when a lot of Americans uh, who should have known better uh, were saying that he was good because he made the trains run on time. So I can talk about this. I was against Mussolini and I was against Hitler, and I'm against uh, equally the communist uh, dictatorship. Now, the Nazis and the communists are simply rival gangsters. Their su supposed hostility is only a greed for power, only the hostility of different gangsters. But that is never made clear in these history texts. In text after text, uh, for example, about uh, the division of Poland, we are told that uh, Hitler's stormtroopers blasted into Poland and the Soviet troops occupied uh, eastern Poland, uh, blasted in and occupied. Uh, th there's a double standard. The truth is not told. And again and again and again in foreign affairs, the truth is not told. Or think in our schools of these horrible questionnaires, these horrible psychological tests that are given. Maybe as parents you don't know about that because they don't want you to know about it. They'll tell the children not to tell the parents. Uh, you'll find it very difficult to get the text of these uh, questionnaires and these tests. But they exist and they they're supposed to be in the interest of mental health, but they are guaranteed to make any healthy child psychologically or spiritually sick. For example, uh, uh, let me just uh, read uh, some of these questions that are given as uh, in questionnaires, that are given in psychological tests. Uh, here, here are some. Uh, this, uh, these questions are to be answered by a flat yes or no, and they were given in some of the greatest schools in the state of California. The world would be better off if science replaced religion as the guiding principle of men's lives. God answers prayers by actually intervening in people's lives. Christ was born of a virgin, as the New Testament says. After death, men will be judged by God for the way he lived on earth. The world would be better off without religion because it is based on superstition. Although there may be a God who created the world, man has no moral obligation to him, and God is not capitalized. There is no apparent ex eternal purpose for man's existence in the universe. Now, what sense to ask uh, children questions like that and suppose they would give a flat yes or no to them? Or questions like these. Man has no soul or spirit. He is just a superior animal with nothing but a physical body, yes or no. Values are all relative. There are no absolute standards of right or wrong, yes or no. Religion is merely a crutch which insecure people rely on, yes or no. Or here uh, a questionnaire entitled The Measurement of Human Wants, given at the Ganesia High School in Pomona, California. How much money would you want to A, spit on a crucifix, B, eat a pound of human flesh, C, desecrate a church service? Now, what degeneracy uh, can even uh, give questions like those? Uh, how, how can you answer questions like that? 
How much money would you take to chop your little brother's head off with an axe? How much money would you take uh, to uh, uh, take a shotgun and shoot your mother? Uh, th they would be just as sensible questions. How much money do you want to spit on a crucifix? How much money do you want to desecrate a church service? And this is supposed to be uh, for mental health. And our Department of uh, Education and Welfare sponsors that sort of thing. They are encouraged by the government. That sort of uh, questionnaire. And then, of course, uh, I won't get into the full question of so-called progressive education. But progressive education, which has afflicted us for some three decades, sliding over into permissive education, which still afflicts us, and being always, I am quite sure, uh, education for collectivism, that sort of education has told us uh, for some decades that uh, uh, you, you, mustn't, uh, you mustn't grade little Johnny. If you grade Johnny, you'll bruise his tender little psyche and he'll shoot his grandmother. <laughs> now, you can't, uh, you can't open a daily paper, but what you see of some ungodly little tyke shooting his grandmother. But I'm sure he wasn't graded too harshly. Why, not too long ago, uh, I read of a, a little horror who shot his grandmother because she courteously asked him to mow the lawn. And another little uh, ungodly tyke hanged himself because his allowance of four dollars a week wasn't enough to keep him in cigarettes. Well, that sort of thing is permissive education, if you will. It is the coddling of the so-called tender little psyche without any discipline whatsoever, any standards whatsoever, any quality, meaning, or value in our education. I'll take some examples of what happens uh, in our higher education, uh, in our colleges. Now, a long time ago, in the early 1950s, um, the Honorable Joseph S. Clark, Jr., who at the time was the mayor of the unfortunate city of Philadelphia, uh, and who has since uh, gone into the uh, United States Congress, uh, he wrote an article in the, in the Atlantic Monthly, and therein he, therein he said that he would define a liberal. Now, this is not my definition of a liberal. This is a liberal of liberals defining a liberal. And he said that all semantics left aside, he would define a liberal as one who uh, would uh, uh, have government at every level, local, state, and national, uh, the tool and agent of human progress. And he went on to say, and I want to quote this exactly, so I'm going to read it. He said this about education. Now, if I had said this, uh, I would be called uh, uh, a scaremonger or a, a right-wing extremist or something like that. But uh, this is what a liberal of liberals said. He said, spiritually and economically, youth is conditioned, notice the word, is conditioned to respond to a liberal program of orderly policing of our society by government. The orderly policing of our society by government. Well, isn't that the police state? And if our liberals, these people who are supposed to believe in freedom, want as their object and say that education is producing the police state, I want none of it. Now compare with that a great American radical conservative, the greatest of Unitarians, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read the words of, of Emerson uh, about uh, these things. Society everywhere is a conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society never advances. Society develops only as man improves. The wise and just man will always feel that he imparts strength to the state, not receive security from it. The first rule of economy is that every man shall maintain himself. And he goes on to say, the wise know that foolish legislation is a rope of sand which perishes in the twisting, that the state must follow and not lead the character and progress of the citizen, and that the form of government which prevails is the expression of what cultivation exists in the population which permits it. Notice the words he uses. The less government we have, the better, the fewer laws and the less confined, uh, confided power. The antidote to this abuse of formal government 
is the influence of private character, the growth of the individual. In all my lectures, I have taught one doctrine, namely the infinitude of the private man. Now, as so-called liberals today in our schools and colleges are always talking about public man, but what we need is private man, the infinitude of the private man. Until, until we restore that to our colleges, we will have no real education. But where on our campuses today is there even a whisper of Emerson's brave doctrine of self-reliance, of Emerson's brave doctrine of the infinitude of the private man? Instead of that, we have, uh, we have had and we still do uh, academic figures who don't know the, the basic facts of life. They're not only eggheads, they're adult eggheads. And these adult eggheads, uh, they uh, are like uh, Robert Hutchins, uh, President Robert Hutchins, when he was president of Chicago University. Now he made the fatuous statement I have, never, I have never been able to find a red professor. Now, uh, the Illinois legislature found plenty of them right on the campus. And just about the time that uh, pres the then President Hutchins said that, a certain professor, Oscar Lange, uh, of the University of Chicago at that time, who had written numerous books praising socialism, suddenly defected. He went over to communist Poland. He became a member of the Quisling Governors of Poland. He returned to un the United States through the United Nations to vilify us, to attack us, uh, to tell how dreadful we were. And still, then President Hutchins wouldn't admit that Oscar Lange was a red professor. When questioned, he said, I don't know what his views now are, but if they are those uh, that he had when he left the University of Chicago, we would welcome him back. Now that's the sort of uh, adult egghead that we, we have in high places. Uh, uh, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that Robert Hutchins is or was a communist. He wasn't. He, he was simply an adult liberal. Uh, he, he just didn't know the score. Uh, he is incapable, really, of the rigor mortis of the intellect necessary for following the party line. The trouble... <laughs> The trouble with Robert Hutchins then and always has been that his theme song is I'm Forever Chasing Bubbles. Uh, he, he reminds me very much of a bottle of ginger ale when you shake it too vigorously and pop the cork too quickly. It's all in the fizz. Uh, he's, he's that sort of liberal. And then there's another sort of liberal. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he's from Boston. He's from Harvard. Uh, professor, now emeritus, Kirtley F. Mather. Mather. Now, uh, Professor Mather, in uh, 1951, uh, made a speech uh, here at the Community Church in Boston. And the good professor said this, and I want to quote him very exactly, so let me read what he said. This, by the way, was reported in the New York Times, so you've got to believe it. Uh, I, take it I take it from the New York Times. Uh, first, uh, the good professor of geology said, according to the New York Times, some American communists between 1930 and 1950 were, were agents of Moscow. You see, he's very generous. Some of them were. Some of them were agents of Moscow. But then he went on and he said, but others, he added, joined the party for its program of social reform. They were idealists, God bless them, who saw injustice and discrimination around them. It is not enough to um, a label a person communist, Dr. Mather declared. What kind of communist was he? That question must be answered before we determine whether he was a threat to security. What kind of communist was he? Now, I just can't believe the good professor was as ignorant or as naive as he seemed. He's been around. He's traveled, as well as fellow traveled. Uh, <laughs> he, he is hep. Uh, he, he knows better than that. Why, uh, 
He must know that uh, you don't sneeze if you're a communist unless the party tells you you can. He must know that you don't send roses to your wife on your wedding anniversary unless it's cleared with the ninth floor. Uh, he must know that uh, uh, you might just as well talk about gentlemanly members of the mafia and rascally members of the mafia as to talk about good communists and bad communists. I can't help believing that the professor was, uh, well, I don't know whether to say talking through his hat or talking through his beret. Uh, but uh, he was talking through something. But that's the sort of person <coughs> that uh, we have had and that unfortunately we still do have in education. And to the last of my knowledge, Professor Mather was reviewing books for the little Phi Beta Kappa magazine. Uh, that, that's uh, the, the honor that they gave him. Uh, and yet, uh, he says, uh, he talks about the communists, and he says, God bless them. Now that uh, is not something that belongs to the past, most unfortunately, it does not belong to the past. Just recently, almost from border to border and almost from coast to coast, colleges and universities have opened their doors and their forums to leaders in the Communist Party, men who have been publicly declared enemies of the United States of America and who even worse than that for the academic life are enemies of truth, of freedom, and of reality. But at Gus Hall, uh, other leaders of the Communist Party, they are welcomed in. Why? Because we must hear both sides. I wonder how many of these same colleges and these same universities invite Robert Welsh uh, to address them uh, so that they may hear both sides. Don't they know? Haven't they read the books now? Are they unaware of the facts of life? Have they been living in a mid-Victorian hush-hush? Don't they know books like uh, The God That Failed, like Darkness at Noon, like The Yogi and the Commissar, like uh, Animal Farm in 1984? Don't they know that the communist conspiracy, as George Orwell described it, is simply this? George Orwell, who in his conscious mind to the very end oddly remained, he thought a socialist, was so wonderfully full of genius that in his unconscious or subconscious mind he told the truth. And in Animal Farm and in 1984 he gives us that truth in beautiful literature. And in 1984 toward the end, uh, Big Brother tells poor uh, Winston Smith this sad fact. He said, would you see the future? It is a boot trampling forever on the human face. Now communism has never better been described than that. A boot trampling forever on the human face. And if our colleges and if our universities do not know today that uh, it is a boot trampling forever on the human face, then they are not intellectual, they are not spiritual, they are not academic, and they do not tell us the truth that shall make us free. They do that, and they do other things too. Just last fall, I believe it was, some 60 professors from Boston University, from MIT, from Harvard, um, sponsored a letter to our president in which they almost ordered him not only not to invade Cuba, but not to let the, Cuban, the Cubans in exiles in exile themselves invade Cuba and restore that side land to freedom. Now, what sort of people do we have in the seats of learning when they are ignorant enough or perverted enough to say a thing like that, to uphold the tyranny of the bearded monstrosity uh, and uh, the human mistake that is known as Fidel Castro? That is the sort of thing that we have. Now what we ought to have in our colleges is great uh, conservators of quality, of meaning, and of value, of reality, and of truth. We all know what the conservationist is in the outer world. The conservationist is one who would preserve our wildflowers and our wild creatures against extermination. He would pres preserve or conserve the purity of our waters against taint and contamination. 
He would conserve our good earth and its fertility against erosion and depletion. And most of all, perhaps, he would conserve our forests that are lovely, dark, and deep against the acts of the too enthusiastic lumberman. Now our colleges should be the conservation department of the inner life, of quality, meaning, and value. Our colleges should defend and conserve individual freedoms, those shy wild flowers, those shy wild creatures. They should be the first to defend the good, humble Amish people uh, who will not pay security, uh, the um, uh, social security tax because they don't believe it. They should be the first to defend the good, humble Amish people who wish to teach their own children their own values, but they don't. And then they, they should uh, conserve the waters of truth against taint and contamination by those uh, to whom truth is simply the most convenient lie and right is simply the most expedient wrong and art is merely propaganda and uh, philosophy is merely ideology. But they don't. They should conserve the good earth of reality, of our political reality and our economic reality and our uh, philosophical reality against those who would erode and who would destroy. They should most of all, perhaps, defend and conserve uh, the spirit of wonder, of beauty, of holiness, of, of God and eternity, uh, those forests that are lovely, dark, and deep, against the greatest lumbering expedition in all history that would reduce all these beautiful things to sawdust and the desert. But they don't. The tragedy of education today is that those uh, who should educate us do not know what education is. The great Plato long ago said that true education is to turn the eye of the soul toward light. But today, those in our educational institutions uh, turn the eye of the soul toward darkness. They bring about darkness at noon. And what we need is a renaissance of the scholastic life, a renaissance of the academic life, in which once more, in the words of the great Plato, we shall indeed turn the eye of the soul toward light. Thank you very much, Dr. Root. I uh, certainly won't accuse him of double-crossing me at, uh, in any way, but I do think he accomplished what I thought was almost impossible, and that was to combine the poetry of his imagination with the facts of his research. <laughs>